is it just nostalgia? We've heard it a lot these past years. The nostalgia is strong in this one. You only enjoyed it better because you were a kid, etc, etc. You hear it everywhere where people are praising the older game, or bashing the industry for ruining their favorite franchise. Sounds like a lot of people are attached to fond memories of the past, but is this from merit, or is it just nostalgia? Locating the personal bias when comparing anything is tricky, none more so than video games. There are layers upon layers of features to sift through. From graphical fidelity, to story and theme, controls, industrial moves forward, technological limitations at the time, to how the devs overcame them. I try myself to check this feeling of ungrounded admiration for the games that came before, but I can't deny, sometimes the first in a series or genre sticks with me more than others. And here's where the first precept I'm going to talk about comes into play. A concept popularized by fellow YouTuber Super Bunny Hop, the Virgin Effect is the idea that your first experience in a genre will be your most impactful and long-lasting. Just ask anyone what their first real time sink into an MMO was, and I'll tell you what their favorite is. Spoiler alert, 9 times out of 10, it's their first major experience in the genre. This applies to game series too. People growing up with the classic games in the Mario and Zelda series are likely to have a strong attachment to those rather than the more recent ones. Ocarina of Time had a bright new 3D world, horse riding, and a seemingly endless landscape to explore at the time. Fast forward a couple decades, and the janky controls and lock-on combat doesn't hold a candle to even a modestly competent action-adventure game today, yet it remains to many their favorite adventure game ever. I've been accused of playing favorites. My love for Super Metroid over its successors, Daggerfall over the later Elder Scrolls games, and others have attracted the ire of the nostalgia police everywhere. But what if there are aspects of those games, lost in the regular polishing and refining phases game genres go through over time? Well, let me make the case of specific instances where aspects, design choices, and mechanical depth was lost over time. In making fine crystalware, it's common practice to immerse the product in an acid bath to remove rough edges and imperfections. Cheaper work gets even more aggressively washed and polished down so that there are no visible errors, but all the delicacy and detail is lost. This is my attempt at an analogy to video games. When you're smoothing out the hiccups and rough edges of a concept over the years, you can accidentally or intentionally cut some of the best choices and ideas with it. Take the Far Cry series for example. Though the original was well received, Far Cry 2 was in many ways a turning point for the series, shooting you headfirst into a malaria-ridden wartime wilderness, both beautiful and dangerous. It had many purposeful limitations and difficulties like little to no fast travel, intermittent malaria episodes, rusty and badly maintained guns that jammed when you least expect them to, and roving patrols that would chase you when spotted. Sure, we all swore when our AK-47 broke down for the 50th time while running into a jeep full of angry soldiers, but what did we lose when the future designers of the series took all these features out? The trend of ditching manual save games or save points for checkpoints in modern games, at first sounds great and makes for a smoother experience. Though to make checkpoints work and not trap you at a completely unplayable point, game and level designers must make compromises to make sure that doesn't happen. Band-aids for the checkpoint problem can be regenerating health, weapons with unlimited ammo, or even infinite respawns. Again, great on the surface, but can greatly impact the nuance of game design underneath. Recent efforts for games to have cinematic sequences can lead to dramatic motion capture animations like in the Uncharted series, which are exciting at first, but all too often inhibit or remove player agency completely. The press X to not die meme is around for a reason. Sometimes you're stripped of movement, aim, or other abilities. Perhaps the designers forgot that this is a game, and this interactive medium can immerse and emotionally impact its audience far more than movies could, if done correctly. This reached its ugly peak in the dreaded surprise quicktime events like in the Mass Effect games, where after 10 minutes of non-interactive cinematics, you can miss a split-second prompt of interactivity. The fact that a player puts down his controller while the game is running is telling enough, but to punish them for doing so is unusually cruel. If some games aren't meant to challenge, frustrate, and punish you, then why are the Soulsborne games immensely popular right now? 
Not all older games are good by today's standards, but to dismiss them simply because they are outdated isn't entirely fair. Today's games, by their inflated and technical nature, need a lot more sales than their predecessors. A game production now can involve hundreds of employees rather than mere dozens. This means attracting both the hardest to the core and the casual audience as well. You can see series simplify and make concessions for every complicated aspect or high skill ceiling mechanic. The Rainbow Six series began with split-second tactical orders and slow, methodical gameplay through surgical operations with blueprint planning and evolving orders, but evolved into a very enjoyable but less original Call of Duty-like game with grappling hooks and breach charges. Stealth games like Thief the Dark Project, where you had to learn patrols and utilize sound, light, and the environment against your foes to succeed, were replaced with mainstreamed stealth games with fantastical powers like invisibility, teleportation, and x-ray vision, acting as a bridge to attract less hardcore audiences. Online role-playing games, from the text-based multi-user dungeons like Major Mud, to MMOs like EverQuest and World of Warcraft, have evolved to become less punishing too. Early on, these games had a live system that would result in permadeath if you weren't careful. Later, you could die infinitely, but would still drop your equipment each time, with the possibility of never reclaiming it. Explaining these choices to your average World of Warcraft player now, with most of these penalties all but removed, would probably make their eyes water. But little can best the satisfaction and immersion of making decisions and dealing with harsh consequences. Video games have progressively been designed to be more accessible, so not only the obsessed, with thick manuals and thousands of hours under their belt can survive. The point is, when people regale about the old days of gaming, they're not always blindly dismissing modern games. They're often reminiscing the danger, risk, and excitement that older, rougher games provided before the training wheels of modern game design were put on. In any two games, you can see different design decisions or actual improvements. Though what is better for the game or worse for the game can be so doused in subjectivity, it can be hard to tell them apart. Objective improvements are often technical. For example, the engine and graphics tweaks made between Call of Duty 3 and 4 on console doubled the working frame rate and greatly increased the readability and reaction time of any situation, an objective improvement. But even the relatively short transition from Grand Theft Auto 4 to 5 saw the emission of numerous physics, animation, and AI subtleties that make the sequel's populace resemble animatronics in comparison. That's a downgrade, and I don't think anybody could argue that. When comparing Zelda A Link to the Past to the more recent Breath of the Wild, there is such an insurmountable amount of differences in philosophy, focus, and structure. It's impossible to say which game is objectively better, other than stating Wild is bigger in scale, I suppose. But that isn't an infallible metric either, because you could use that argument when comparing The Witcher 3 and No Man's Sky, one of which has a finite amount of quests, and the other a literal universe filled with content that could exceed a human lifetime to explore. But you're probably not going to say Sky holds your attention for as long though, or has the tailor-made quality and variety Witcher offers. So the next time someone tells you that you only like that game due to nostalgia, take a good hard look at what you enjoy in it. Is it a classic case of the Virgin Effect, where it was your first and therefore most impressive? Or was there a design decision or challenge that impacted you more that's lost in its successors? We can't always be completely objective, those rose-tinted glasses are just too comfortable, but I firmly believe there is a lot more to older or influential games than simply nostalgia. So the next time it's claimed your classic can't hold a candle to modern games, tell them to take a closer look and see what makes that game tick. It may just surprise them. That's it for me today. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see retrospectives, reviews, and rants like these, make sure to subscribe. A shout out to my patrons for helping make this worthwhile. And as always, thank you for watching.